What prison could hold a man who could escape from any trap on Earth? For Mr. Miracle, the darkest corner of the mind may be the one place from which there is no way out. Mr. Miracle, written by Tom King with art by frequent collaborator Mitch Gerrits, is a 12-issue DC Comics miniseries that spanned from 2017 through 2018 and tells the story of Scott Free, aka Mr. Miracle, a super escape artist who hails from the worlds of the new gods. This race of higher space beings, created by Jack Kirby in 1971, is composed of the warring factions of the benevolent New Genesis, led by Highfather, and the malevolent Apocalypse, led by Darkseid. But instead of focusing on a classic tale of high adventure, King's story concentrates on the everyday life of Mr. Miracle and his wife Big Barda. Together, the two enjoy being minor celebrities on Earth, while attempting to balance everyday demands against the increasingly frequent intrusions of the ultimate war between good and evil. But this fight to find a meaningful life and save the universe takes place in the aftermath of Scott's attempted suicide, with his home life, sanity, and place in the New Gods' War spiraling out of control from there. By colliding dark fantasy with the realities of PTSD, depression, family, and war, King creates a story about what it takes to hold on to who you love in a world that is falling apart, and what must be sacrificed to keep them safe. If that sounds dark and brutal to you, well, it is. But its highs and lows, laughs and shocks, romance and horror all come from King and Garrett's creating stark contrasts. Juxtaposition of high comic book stakes with real-life mundanity. Modern decompressed storytelling with the intrusion of classic Jack Kirby third-party narration at the start and end of each issue. Bright and colorful costumes with blunt violence. This isn't a secret recipe. The formula is quite clear from the very start of the miniseries. But in knowing that this is King's approach, readers sense that something is not quite right. No matter how simple or banal the actions on the page may be, these contrasts are what power Mr. Miracle's narrative and themes. It's also the source of its tragedy, as this contrast lies within the heart of Mr. Miracle himself, a brightly colored hero whose origins feel like Jesus meets Flash Gordon. In most other hands, a classic story of Mr. Miracle would be a tale focused on thrilling escapes and bombastic battles. But King, who definitely likes his superheroes run down and wrecked, places a brokenness within Scott Free's heart. If it isn't clear from his suicide attempt at the very start of the series, Scott is dealing with a ton of trauma. After all, the hero was born on New Genesis but given to Darkseid as a peace treaty, after which he lived a young life of torture until he and his wife Big Barda escaped. To Scott, the world seems… wrong, and he says so at the end of the very first issue to Barda. I see things. I do things. Things that aren't… I don't know how to escape this. I can't escape this. While we only experience Mr. Miracle's world in the aftermath of his suicide attempt, everything from little details, such as Big Barda's eyes being a different color than Scott remembers, to universe-encompassing horrors, like the inescapable toll of constant war, seem like they shouldn't be this way. The question is, is this world actually wrong, or is Scott's mind simply broken beyond repair? In either case, is there really any chance of escape for this super escape artist? In an interview with Pace Magazine in 2017, King revealed that the claustrophobic feeling of being caught in a world that doesn't seem right sprung from a massive panic attack that landed him in the hospital. I'd flirted with the edge of death and came back from it, and I woke up and the whole world seemed different. I don't mean this in a political way, but the world as it is today, what's happening every single day, doesn't seem to make any sense. Mr. Miracle is a husband, and his depression weighs on Big Barda too, with Scott's questioning of his world often coming between the two of them and creating a sort of disconnect that is highlighted in moments when Scott is alone. This disconnect reaches its own sort of climax in issue number 6, with Mr. Miracle and Barda fighting the forces of New Genesis to prevent Scott's execution at the hands of his brother Orion, who has become increasingly unhinged. But with Barda revealing that she's pregnant, and Orion dead at the hands of Darkseid, the stakes of Mr. Miracle shift to something more personal in its second half. A time jump to the birth of their son Jacob and an escalation in the war means that Scott is not only fighting his depression and apocalypse for the sake of the world, but for both wife and child. When Darkseid offers complete surrender in exchange for Scott giving him Jacob, husband and wife are forced to confront the suicide attempt and what they're willing to give up for peace. 
King shows Mr. Miracle as suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder as a result of his years of physical, emotional, and mental scarring on Apocalypse. We don't see how it led to his suicide attempt, but surviving hasn't cured him, and an ongoing depression mutes his reactions to both the great and terrible things that happen throughout the series. A special mirror from abusive mother figure Granny Goodness reveals just how much torture was inflicted on both Scott and Barda, despite the many surgeries that healed their appearance. As leader Highfather and brother Orion are both killed during the war, Scott is forced to shoulder even greater responsibilities while still reeling from his near-death experience. The cracks begin to show as Scott is forced to fight in an increasingly horrific war, throw in Barda's unexpected pregnancy, and both Scott and the reader must consider what it means to raise a family in a world that seems hopeless. Personal burdens and the grim realities that are highlighted when cosmic wars are contrasted with the simplicities of life give King and Garrods a different way to approach Jack Kirby's fourth world, which has long existed on the fringes of DC Comics after its creator's death. It's a superhero world that has given life to decades of twisting, epic, often contradictory stories that never seem to have a definitive beginning or end. A cycle of constant war between good and evil that drives these central characters and presses down on the shoulders of Scott Free. But King and Garrett's Mr. Miracle exists within a world that doesn't quite fit into any specific continuity, whether classic or modern. Scott's story doesn't seem to align with the current state of DC Comics. This isn't just a device to tell a story where anything can happen, and the battle between New Genesis and Apocalypse can be advanced in ways impossible when tied to the rigid world of cyclical superhero stories. It's also the biggest clue to the lie of Mr. Miracle's world. For nothing is truly what it seems. And the truth is... The world that Scott Free now finds himself in isn't reality at all. The final issue of Mr. Miracle gives us several different possibilities as to where he is as the ghostly figures of the dead confront Scott over his decision to stay in this unreality. Scott either killed himself, which is what Granny Goodness tells him, and is now in hell, as stated by Forager, or heaven, suggested by Orion, or he was hit by Darkseid's anti-life equation, an attack designed to break a person's will by sending him or her to a type of personal, existential prison. These figures represent how past trauma lingers, even after healing. In any case, Scott has left the normal world. When Scott and Barda kill Darkseid in the climax, he is given the chance to escape and return to his former reality by new god Metron, but he refuses. After so much suffering, Scott has overcome his demons and built a happy life for himself and his family. If the regular DC Universe, with its constant reboots and never-ending cycle of good and evil, is just as unreal as the world Scott has made for himself, then why should he abandon the family he's made? It's a conclusion hinted at earlier in Issue 9. Fellow New God Kanto discusses a story in which a flock of birds mistakes a painting for grapes. To the birds, it isn't art, it's just what is. And what's better than what is? To Scott, this world is what is, and he's decided not to shake apart that reality. Mr. Miracle No. 1 has perhaps the most clues as to the true nature of Scott's surroundings as, in the aftermath of his suicide attempt, Reality seems to be twisted by an unseen malevolent force. Panels glitch and distort at seemingly normal moments of life. A friendly talk show appearance contrasts heavily against Scott's troubles. And an all-black panel declaring, Dark Side is, appears more and more frequently, eating up the panels until it takes up an entire page. Dark Side's malevolent existence asserts its dominance over the reality of this world, not just the presentation of it. Even Darkseid himself is aware of the existence of these panels. But there's just enough of a glimmer of doubt regarding Scott's perceptions as to keep readers in limbo regarding this reality throughout the issues that follow. The rest of the miniseries follows Scott working to get himself on steady ground so that he can be a good husband, loving father, and a hero strong enough to defeat Darkseid. But if Scott is fighting for nothing real and just accepts what shouldn't be, is that really a good thing? Is King and Garrett's book telling us that we should fight to have just enough and then accept the rest of the world? Hey, this video is starting to fall apart. Much like King's earlier series, The Vision, for Marvel, Mr. Miracle employs the use of third-party voiceover to create a sense of doom. However, instead of the vague foreshadowing used in Vision, King uses a boisterous narration at the start and end of each issue that is done in the style of, and often entirely lifted from, the first 12 issues of Jack Kirby's 1970s Mr. Miracle comic books. It's chipper and loud, 
proclaiming the wonders of the new gods and the dangers of the traps that await Mr. Miracle, super escape artist. These narrative captions are often placed over scenes of domestic life or cliffhanger reveals that skew darker than traditional 70s comics. As such, readers are given a sense of lurking dread that not everything is alright within even the simplest of daily routines. While you might think that this would be a clue that tied King series to Kirby's original comics, it's not. Metron's reveal in issue 11 clearly shows the DC Comics universe in 2018, not the 1970s. King and Garrods also employ a strict use of the nine-panel grid throughout their story, breaking the format only six times throughout the course of their 12 issues. Commitment to the nine-panel grid is very Tom Kingian, especially when teamed up with Garrods, and King has a very clipped rhythm to his writing, with brief sentences, repetition, and pauses of discomfort used frequently in his writing, not just in Mr. Miracle. The result is that his characters often read as having a flat affect to their speech. That works to varying degrees depending on the story and the characters that he's writing, how often it's employed, and the art style that accompanies it. For a clinically depressed character like Mr. Miracle, it works great. For a robot trying to be a man like The Vision, it makes sense. For Batman, not so much. The combination of King's writing and Garrett's presentation here dictates story beats, comedic and dramatic timing, and the overall trap aesthetic of the story. The nine-panel grid, a very traditional, staccato approach to classic comic booking, has been used since the format came to prominence in the 1930s. And while there are many applications for it, the traditional approach utilizes nine panels for its ability to cram as much story into each page as possible. When applied to a more decompressed approach to narrative, the precise approach of using nine panels with the same formatting applied throughout informs how readers should interpret any changes in tone, or even slight disruptions to the grid. Static disruptions jump out to the reader even more because of just how obviously they upset this rhythm. This isn't a subtle comic. It's actually wonderfully freeing to have the nine panel grid because you no longer have to worry about the reader having to interpret anything. They know exactly how to read it said Garrods, so you don't have to worry about time. You get to play with time in a way that you can't do on a multi-panel, multi-angled page. The panel gutters in Mr. Miracle also shift between black and white, black representing scenes on fourth world planets and white representing Earth, which help to subtly inform the shifting tone of the book. But in both settings, Garrods uses a grimy, newsprint-inflected digital inking pattern to emphasize the worn-out nature of the increasingly hirsuted Scott in particular. It's often contrasted with the bright, clean patterns of the new god's costumes, once again pushing the book's contrast between high fantasy and more realistic issues. Garrods typically frames his scenes at a neutral eye level, with characters facing forward or at a 90-degree perpendicular vantage point. Often, this is used to set a scene or a viewpoint within a location, interconnecting multiple panels, and then cutting between the triptych that composes the frame to emphasize action or character relationships. The result is an impartiality that emphasizes Scott's numbed senses when caught in the grips of depression. With the nine-panel format, the framing becomes somewhat claustrophobic in conjunction with the trap Mr. Miracle finds himself in. The effect is heightened when a larger image is created out of multiple interconnected panels, causing the grid to begin to look like a cage. A cage because this has all been a giant trap. While the truth of Scott's world is left ambiguous by King and Garrett's, a final page, blank face proclamation of Dark Side Is by Big Barda seems to lean toward this world being a product of the anti life equation. Tie that together with Scott discussing Los Angeles and saying, People just come here because they think they have to, and then they don't leave because they think they can't. And Barda's response of, Darling, please, after everything, haven't you learned by now? That's all love is. And we suddenly have a very cynical look at love and marriage. In fact, Barda is fairly disaffected by Scott's spiral into depression throughout this entire series. The idea that Scott is trapped in the anti-life equation and is generally okay with it is certainly dark, but at least it's better than implying suicide is the answer to your problems. And let me make it clear, suicide is not the answer to your problems. If we strip away the mystery of what exactly happened to Mr. Miracle to land him in this alternate reality, we can view King's comic as an extended metaphor for coming to terms with a new reality that is brought on by marriage, having children, and being forced to cope with the world changing around you. We try to carve out our own happy little corner, one that will make a bright future possible for our children, knowing that it will cost us everything as parents.
Vague references to seeing the face of God are scattered throughout these 12 issues without an answer to what that exactly means. In its final pages, we're given the solution. In a moment of looking at his son, Scott sees his small place in the world and all of history, of all the fathers and sons that have come before him and will come after. While it scared him at first, he soon accepted it. And then I wasn't scared, and I didn't have to run, and I just enjoyed it, seeing all of it, all of us, going back and forward, like looking into the face of God. Scott sees past himself and toward his son's life and the larger world. When little, each child sees their parent as a godlike figure. High Father was a god that betrayed Scott, Darkseid the hateful god that replaced him, Granny Goodness the abusive god to Scott and Barda. They all fell short and caused the trauma that led to Scott's attempt on his own life, unable to cope with the idea of a god who would hurt him. Now, Scott sees that he can fulfill such a role for his son Jacob and his soon-to-be-born daughter in this new reality. That's the new world that he has made by choosing to stay. That is the fourth world. The older worlds of past generations have made way for something new. This new reality that was once fantasy and is now the future for Scott, Barda, and their children. The world may not be the ordinary one you once recognized, but it's the one you must come to terms with to have any hope of happiness. And the darkness and trauma that haunts us may never truly leave. But it doesn't need to stand in the way of finding peace with those we love. Dark side is. But so are we. Wait. That doesn't make any sense. Clearly Barda existed before Scott died, and now she's been left behind in favor of a figment of imagination. Those kids might be the lump sent to ruin Scott's mind. This is bull- Dark side is. How many jumbled metaphors and nine panel pages can someone fit into a comic until he just can't take Dark side is. No. This video isn't real at all. Get out. Get out while you still-